Hey everybody, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna start the lectures for module seven. All right. So we're gonna start with confessions of a recovering misogynist. Um, this article was a little rough to get through. There were some um, depictions of things and accounts that he had had with, especially in his interactions and engagements with women. Um, some of them were very abusive in nature. Some of them were, um, uh, were very hard to sit with. Um, and especially as he recounts them and recounting, looking back on them in the ways he is now working through them with, with a different set of lens and a different set of perspectives um, versus what was thought to be normal or the kind of ways you treat women. And so really looking at that um, and these, these depictions, not only just as, as violence in and of themselves, but also looking at this as that normalizing factor really um, speaks volumes to the level of which we um, have ingrained violence against women to be part of masculinity in this very, very unhealthy and toxic dynamic. Um, and so I just kind of want to hit on a few highlights um, and really walk through some of the ideas that he touches on, right? Um, so he talked about how the presence, um, how he kept seeing male presence as leadership. So within his church, he saw male leaders. Um, those teachers, um, especially at a collegiate level, the uh, bosses, the people that he interacted with and in leadership roles continuously were men with the exception of his aunts and his mother. And his mother who he very much um, blamed for his father's actions, very much blamed for the abandonment um, that he felt from his father. And so, and, and for the economic instability. So creating that dynamic where the female leadership is, is the result of all the problems and the male leadership was this idyllic notion of where I want to be, created again that dynamic, that, that hate for women. Um, he talks a little bit about polite sexism and that's kind of this, this idea that, um, that, that you don't have to necessarily treat women inherently badly um, to also mistreat or not want equality, right? Um, and so he talks about some of the women that he worked with, especially in, when it came to like the fraternity, uh, sorority and fraternity um, aligned campaigns and things like that and where they would be working together um, as um, black, uh, black fraternity leaders and black sorority leaders to meet a certain end. However, he still looked at these, these women as less than. And so while he may have treated them with respect for what it was that they were doing in that project or what have you, there was this still, but you know, I still don't see you as an equal kind of mentality that framed their interactions. Um, so where trauma and self-determinism meets violence, I really want to talk here about, um, it was very clear that the social instability, the trauma, um, of some of the things that he had in his past, um, led to this idea that he had to keep proving himself and the way he chose to prove himself was through this violence or this, 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 I must be greater than where I must be more powerful in order to evade um, more trauma or to evade more um, negative outcomes for myself, really perpetuated this violence against others, um, especially women and this sexism that he, he prescribed to um, within, within coll collegiate arenas and, and then some. But I, it, you know, it is very poignant to think about the idea of um, when you are marginalized in other ways, and for him, this was race, um, and you're in any kind of setting with other men, especially white men, possibly, where you are trying to engage in that male privilege where your race might inhibit that in some ways, that engaging in these misogynistic behaviors or these sexist behaviors allowed him the space to um, really engage with and uh, 
tap into that male privilege. And so really allowing that, that understanding where that comes from really helps to kind of navigate and check um, ourselves when we're in situations where we might be engaging with um, any other kind of group or dismissing another group in order to gain certain privileges that we might hold in other settings, right? And we've seen white women in, in social movements, especially feminist movements, do this to women of color in order to gain um, social standing with white men and create maybe a better um, solutions or solutions to the problems that they felt they had, um, but not necessarily to help women as a whole become more equal, right? And so we want to make sure that we're, we're tapping into where we might be engaging in um, ostracizing more marginalized groups in order to engage in maybe some privilege we might hold with, with, with white male able-bodied body, blah, 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 right? The, the, the typical norms of society. Um, I'm sorry, like when, when we talk about trauma too, when we talk about how we use or when violence is used or when we use any kind of othering behavior to compensate for any um, lack thereof one might feel, we talk about this in terms of like fragile fear, right? So we have this fear of being or being seen as less than. And so by, by engaging in, in behaviors that make someone else feel more or less than me, then that, that where I am on the totem pole doesn't feel as bad or that fear is not as, not as valid, not as concerning. And so this really meets back into that trauma narrative where trauma begets trauma. That's not always the case. And those are choices that someone makes. And no matter what happens and no matter what marginalizations this man felt, the acts that he did against women and, and the situations that um, predicated those aren't okay. Um, and that's something that we have to consistently work to make sure that we are not ascribing to or perpetuating any kind of harm to anyone else uh, as we walk through our own paths and our own, our own narratives, our own personal histories. Um, so he talks about this idea of swimming upstream. So he talks about the fact that like, despite the fact that he is aware of a lot of the situations that he has created, he still is swimming upstream through this. He is still recovering. He is still somebody who is sexist. He is still somebody who's embedded in this ideologies that have been portrayed to him of, of, of this hierarchy amongst the genders, right? And so making sure that he's talking about this continuous battle, right? This, I'm gonna keep coming up against that, those ideologies and I have to keep fighting those instincts or those learned behaviors, more, more apt, those learned behaviors that have society has geared me to do that are misogynistic and sexist. Um, and again, we kind of talked about this powerlessness already. Um, but again, I, the last thing I kind of want to touch on is while he talks about um, really engaging in the fact that he is still sexist, he is still has these ideologies, these things still play out in, in negative ways. We really, again, I want to reemphasize the fact that we as individuals, no matter who we are, um, hold certain privileges and also her, hold certain marginalizations. And that just depends on where you are and who you are, which ones those are. And we need to make sure that as we navigate those marginalizations or even as we navigate our own privileges, we are not like causing more harm and that we are cognizant of the harm having that privilege may be doing to someone else. Um, and so really it's not to say that those privileges automatically make us a bad person, but lack of acknowledgement and lack of work towards gaining equality amongst whatever that privilege might be does perpetuate and consistently create harms for those people that are marginalized. And so making sure that we are again cognizant of those things is part of making society more equitable um, and part of making social change happen. So that's really all I have for that one. I will be back shortly to discuss some of the other readings for this week.
I hope you all are having a great day.